I'd now like to ask um, um, Sir Kaizon Chang, who's a senior economist in, in charge of the sector of the FAO uh, that covers hides, skins and leather. Thank you, um, Chair. Thank you, Luca and Unic, for inviting me here. And uh, good afternoon to you, ladies and gentlemen. My brief this afternoon is to provide you with an overview of the market monitoring work that we do in FAO on the hides, skins, and leather value chain. The market trends based on the data and information contained in our annual hides and skins compendium, which is available on the website of the Food and Agriculture Organization, and the policies affecting uh, production and trade. Eyes and skins um, are important to FAO um, as it, it is an important item in um, international agricultural trade and an essential raw material for industrial development in developing countries. As FAO's mandate is to feed the world, they also contribute significantly to food security of producers in many of these developing countries through export earnings from um, raw hides and skins, which is estimated to be over $45 billion uh, currently. And they provide employment and job creation to numerous hides, skins, and leather-specific artisan industries in these countries. The global market for leather and leather products is huge as mentioned earlier this morning. Even without including the significant value of leather used in upholstery uh, for automobiles and household furnitures, as well as mixed leather footwear, the value of world trade in leather and leather products was estimated at nearly $90 billion in 2014. This value is much greater than the combined value of world trade of meat, sugar, coffee and tea combined. In terms of production, as bovine hides and skins dominate the leather value chain, accounting for over 94% of the total hides and skins produced, most of the data and discussion in my presentations refer to bovine hides and skins. The production of raw hides and skins is largely determined by the demand for meat rather than the dynamics in the leather supply chain, as you heard earlier on. The raw hides and skins are byproducts of um, meat and also, therefore, are supply inelastic. In other words, a change in prices of raw hides and skins does not trans translate into a corresponding change in the supplies of raw hide. However, and then bovine hides and skins production in developing countries has trended upwards in the last decade, driven by economic growth, particularly in emerging economies, while production in developed countries have fallen since 2008. Coinciding with the global economic slowdown and reduction in consumption of red meat. In the longer term, production is expected to continue to rise as growth in developing countries is accelerating faster than the rate of deceleration in developed countries. However, in trade, trade in hides and skins are largely influenced by livestock size, disease outbreak, economic growth, meat consumption, and the dynamics in the market for leather end products. Over the last decade, Trade has um, expanded significantly, though export values expanded faster than shipment volumes, so implying increases in unit price. China and the European Union have been the um, leading importers of bovine hides and skins over the last decade. And in 2012, China finally surpassed the EU in um, imports of hides and skins. 
Italy remains the largest importer in the European Union, accounting for more than half of all imports. As for exports, the European Union and the United States together account for more than two-thirds of the world exports, and projections are for modest growth in the near term. The dynamics in the major leather products market, the demand for leather is influenced by the dynamics in the footwear and leather product markets, as you've heard earlier. And an increase in demand for these products would result in the increase of demand in demand for leather. And these are determined by the economic growth and the level of disposable incomes of consumers in these countries. The world trade of leather products which are classified under Chapter 42 uh, and in the harmonized system, which includes um, the articles of leather, saddles, harness, travel goods, and handbags, uh, increased from just under $30 billion in 2003 to nearly $70 billion um, in the end of 2014, uh, beginning of 2015. Similarly, for leather products classified under Article 64, which, is, um, which includes foodware, the trade doubled from about $67 billion in 2003 to $130 billion currently. The major importers of products classified under these two articles are the EU, China, United States, and Russian Federation. In terms of prices, Heisen Skin's prices have largely been on an upward trend in the last decade, except for 2009 when prices declined sharply, reflecting the beginning of the global economic recession. And the income elasticity of de leather and demand Beyond 2009, prices recovered in 2010 and rose significantly until 2015, as um, economies of a few emerging markets, including Brazil and China, have slowed. Now, let's turn to some of the challenges in the hides and skin sector in developing countries. As most developed countries have the technical capacity to operate tanning and production of leather end products, most of our effort in FAO has been directed in improving the sector in developing countries. Among the many challenges in the hides and skins sector in developing countries, production of high quality hides and trade is probably the biggest. Dealing with pre-slaughter defects has proven to be a major challenge as farmers do not benefit directly from uh, the sale of hides and skins and therefore have no incentive to improve quality. <coughs> Typically, they are paid 60% of the live weight of an animal. This is based on the so-called fifth quarter um, of the pricing model. It is the livestock traders in the developing countries that benefit from the sales of hides and skins. But since they are getting them for free, there is also no incentive to improve quality. And therefore, unless they are made accountable, any attempt at reducing a slaughter defects would be futile. Secondly, as with most commodity value chains, income distribution among the value chain is critical to development of the chain. Skewed margins, which do not include a fair return to investment, undermine the effectiveness and efficiency of the chain. Examples in developing countries include uh, collectors economizing on the use of salt because they feel they are not receiving a fair price, hence affecting quality of hides and skins that are traded. Similarly, there are Production in remote areas are not being collected because margins are insufficient to cover the transportation costs. As for international trade, 
most of the challenges are non-tariff in nature, or NTBs, as tariff levels of raw hides and skins are pretty low. And if you are a least developing, uh, developing country, like LDC countries, um, import is usually duty free. And therefore, prominent development in the last decade is the introduction of export restrictions to encourage domestic value addition in a lot of developing countries. This development in the supply chain is a two-edged sword. Although value addition has occurred, export restrictions have also resulted in supply surpluses because of insufficient processing capacities domestically and therefore lowering, lowering the prices considerably and discouraging collections within the country. Ironically, the weakening of domestic prices has raised prices globally because of the corresponding shortfall in international markets. It's, it's a dilemma that they, these countries have to deal with and are working through. Other non-tariff uh, barriers to trade includes the technical uh, standards and the sanitary and phytosanitary standards that have been used to establish um, the product and technical standards traded internationally. Many developed countries have been using provisions in the technical barriers there, or TBT and SPS agreements to prescribe environmental standards, for example, higher than internationally agreed standards under Codex and the International Plant Protection Committee negotiated standards under WTO and uh, with the potential effects on actually impeding market access. Developing countries have real problems in terms of structural as well as technical capacity to comply with these requirements. On average, producers in developing countries face greater supply side constraints than their developed country counterparts. Hence, the NTBs have a disproportionate uh, negative impact on the ability of developing countries to compete in international markets. The main environmental concerns of the tanning industry in these countries focus on the disposal of the large volumes of potentially hazardous waste, which contaminates surface and groundwater, as well as um, impacting the, work, uh, the health of workers. These challenges can be addressed by improving environmental friendly technologies in the wet blue process uh, that account for 80% of the pollution, which occur at the tanning stage. However, resource constraints uh, in these countries limit the ability of developing countries developing these uh, technologies. So what sort of policy responses they require to tackle some of these uh, challenges? Let's look at some. Despite the importance of the sector, there is a lack of institutional support necessary to effectively develop the sector in developing countries. Unlike other commodities, which are championed by the formal uh, production and or marketing boards, or producer and marketing boards, um, the hygiene skins subsector in the developing countries have no or very little institutional support. So without the institutional support, there is a paucity of uh, appropriate policy and financial support from stakeholders in the public and private sectors, undermining the income trickle-down effect to farmers um, and hides and skins collectors. In regard to the challenges in quality and removal of skewed margins in the value chain, policies need to be um, put in place to facilitate the efficient functioning of the value chain and better linking producers to markets. Institutional strengthening would facilitate implementation of government policies to provide credit uh, and input facilities, for example, along with clear and enforceable standards 
that would optimize supplies of good quality hides and skins. The creation of efficient producer organization will also enhance the producers' economies of scale and bargaining positions to realize better and fair remuneration for their products. In addition, better pricing policies need to be negotiated along the value chain to, at the very least, reduce the benefits derived from the fifth quarter uh, pricing model and appropriately reward participants along the chain. For example, livestock producers should be paid for the hides and skins of the animals they produce, which would in turn increase the accountability of livestock traders to maintain quality so that they get the best possible reward for the hides and skins. In regard to export restrictions to encourage domestic value addition, the long-term impact of this policy is a reduction in world trade of hides and skins, as production of wet blue and finished leather becomes decentralized. In the short run, this would improve the economy, economic welfare of countries which have adopted this policy, as with the case in Ethiopia, Kenya, and Uganda, for example, in Africa. However, as more countries adopt this policy, global welfare in the leather sector would decline due to the, these economies of scale as production units become smaller and the largest negative impact of this would be experienced by countries in the Far East that have invested heavily in tanning capacities despite limit, uh, having limited livestock numbers. Experience over the last decade suggests that the success of such a policy depends on an efficient and effective government system which would minimize smuggling and support capitalized, capitalization of tanneries in the developing countries. In the East African community, as you heard this morning from Professor, all countries except Rwanda have imposed export restrictions, the nature of which varies from country to country and from ad valorem export tax, specific export tax, or total ban altogether. These policies were implemented since 2000, with Ethiopia being the pace setter, followed by Tanzania, Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, and Burundi. FAO is actually working with COMESA to try and evaluate the impact of these policies on investment and um, improve tanning capacity. In terms of environment policy responses, the environmental policy responses deal largely with standards and technical regulations. It is imperative to note that government, governments are faced with immense pressure to balance demands from consumers, activists, and those from the industry. Environmental regulations impose significant costs slow productivity growth and thereby hinder the ability of firms to compete in international markets. The loss of competitiveness also results in the movement uh, of processing or manufacturing capacity to countries where environmental regulations are less stringent. However, over the long run, the effects tend to be smaller than in the short run, suggesting that government policies can help reduce or offset the transitory impacts of environmental regulations on competitiveness. Internationally, the estimated effects of environmental regulations on trade and investment locations so far are not as significant um, in comparison to other detriments such as market conditions and health quality of local workers. Moreover, the social benefits of environmental regulations, in particular in terms of improved health, often seem to vastly outweigh their costs. And in conclusion, the um, global leather value chain remains one of the most important agro-based value chain 
whose value-added products have a global appeal. The future of the industry depends on how it will deal with challenges associated with human safety, environment, and climate change issues. Developing countries are working hard to improve value addition in their own backyards rather than be a net exporter of raw materials. However, their limited capacity to meet standards set by big markets such as the EU may impact negatively uh, on their agenda to improve the performance of the leather sector. There is a need, therefore, both in global and regional level to bring the leather sector to the fore as mechanism of stimulating interest to support projects and programs which are aimed at improving the sector. Until recently, the impact of environmental reg regulations was felt primarily in the high-income countries where tanners have claimed that costs involved in pollution uh, treatments added to their higher wage costs and have eroded their international competitiveness. Relocation to um, evade compliance with environmental standard is one phenomenon which is unlikely to be profitable in the long run because as these standards rise in developing countries, the relative balance of advantages will probably swing in favor of the tanneries which, are, which already have adequate treatment plans in place. But few companies in developed countries, if any, will relocate to developing countries solely because of environmental cost considerations. Costs of raw material and capital are likely to be more important factors. Thank you.